With Guild Wars 2 coming to Steam, I made a new account to try out the new player experience again. I leveled up the intended way with map completion and story 10 years ago when the game first came out, and since then I've had enough tomes of knowledge to get any character I want to instantly max level. A lot has changed since then, like the story pacing, the classes, and of course my experience with the game's mechanics and systems. The leveling process would be balanced toward a new player, so a seasoned veteran like me would naturally breeze through the process making it wholly uninteresting. So that's why I designed a challenge for myself. While leveling and doing story, if my character dies, I delete them and start over. I have an entire video linked in the description about why you would want to do this, but in short, when your character's life is worth more, you pay more attention to the game's mechanics, take full advantage of the systems, find more meaning in your character's progression, and become more aware of your surroundings. Of course, this would still be a bit too easy, so I created some personal rules such as can't use account bound currencies or items except karma, only items I learn through leveling or by completing heart quests, no waypointing unless I'm at a waypoint, and staying within areas and story missions within my level range. Oh, and I also have to solo all the story dungeons during the process. So I set a goal to defeat Zaitan which marks the end of the core game story, and since Zaitan bolsters his army with more undead the more people die, we're going to need to minimize our deaths, like keep them to zero. So I started my new journey on this account with my main class, Sho Kinsu, the human thief. It's kind of nice making a new character with all the new faces and hairstyles they've added to the core game parallel to the expansions. So I use one of the Canthan faces from End of Dragons. His backstory is he is a commoner and he has a long lost sister. You see, when Zaitan rose ore from the depths of the Sea of Sorrows, he created a barrier between Krita and Cantha. And Cantha essentially closed its borders. And during that time, Sho's family had been in Krita, so they couldn't return to their homeland. Now Thief is a really fun class to level on because it's so mobile and burst oriented that it's perfect for chain killing mobs in open world. However, it's also one of the squishiest classes with the least amount of active defenses. It needs to avoid things to survive, and with dungeons on the menu, things can get very dicey, but luckily blinds will fully mitigate a lot of the pressure you take, and stealth can be used to fight on my own terms. After all, I'm in no rush, this is a challenge to survive. It's a marathon, not a sprint, so I can take my time. Sho and his sister actually became members of the Seraph, the police of Divinity's Reach. But one day his sister disappeared while on duty and the Seraph swept this incident under the rug. Sho took it personally to uncover the corruption of the Seraph afterwards, especially that Logan Thackeray character who always tried to take justice into his own hands. That being said, he was given the opportunity to investigate the disappearance of the Falcon Company where his sister had gone missing, and although he found the culprits to the crime, he's an honorable thief that offered to spare them a trial. Sho is just glad that he could rescue his sister from the human trafficking she was sold into, and if you thought that was corrupt, wait till you hear about Minister Codicus who's dealing with bandits and rebels who are trying to ruin the peace treaty with the Char by kidnapping the Queen and the Char ambassador. So naturally, Sho went ahead with Logan to the minister's estate. This is where the challenge really begins to become difficult. There are snipers who deal more damage to moving targets, thugs who knock you around, and also some bandits will put plenty of condition stacks on you. These groups of mobs have no mercy and it's a test of your ability to kite and line of sight. You need to take full advantage of stealth and mobility to not die. Well, that, that was a bit hasty. Getting revealed early instead of getting the full effect of stealth? I guess Sho is dead. Forever. He died to the corrupt politicians he was trying to expose and he will never get to see Kantha again. Next character is Bree 
Aeroshine, the humble goat cheese farmer from the Shiver Peaks. This Norn Ranger will surely be able to beat Zaitan, right? Rangers are definitely one of the best solo leveling classes because of how powerful the pet mechanic is for tanking enemies and dealing damage while you survive. So while we were leveling, we caught a bunch of new pets, and all of them have cheese names like Blue, Jack, and Colby. Unlike Sho, who was a seraph overly concerned with justice, Bree was simple but skilled at her craft. After being invited to Codicus Manor by Destiny's Edge, she surpassed Sho and saved the queen and Mia Kindleshot just because she was doing her best to help out. Afterwards, Bree decided to continue her adventures. Instead of sitting idly on her cheese farm and tending to the goats, she wanted to make a difference in the world. Bree took on the three worms terrorizing the Blood Tide Coast with little to no issues. Then she ventured into Twilight Arbor with Kate. This dungeon has quite a diverse set of enemies with unique ways of handling them. But the final boss against Fowlin and her clones of Destiny's Edge is the true challenge. You need to take out all four of them and Air does tons of damage with her bow. Zoja summons a golem and blinds you. Ritlock leaps at you and gets in your face. And Logan, well, he doesn't really do much. But when you take out one of these clones, Fowlin ports to them to revive them. And you need to deal enough damage to her to prevent resummoning the clone. Let me remind you, I'm using gear I get while leveling. So you need to whittle down one of the mobs while kiting the others, then finish it off while preparing to burst Fowlin. When one of them has been defeated permanently, it gets much easier. And Bree didn't stop there. She went deep inside Sorrow's Embrace with Zoja to stop Kudu, but with a small misstep, Bree fell into the lava and this cheese farmer became fondue. Next character has to be the one, right? So here is Raymond the Shaman, a Char Elementalist whose father used to be in the Flame Legion, which raises many questions to his loyalty to the Blood Legion. The thing is, Raymond is also Flame Legion, but to infiltrate the Legions, he needs to become a double agent, giving them plausible information on the Flame Legion in order to get information in return. However, Raymond's background can't hide from the Order of Whispers who are a bunch of spies. They knew he was Flame Legion, and because of that, they also knew how good of a spy he was. Of course, the Order of Whispers cares more about what gets done and not how it gets done, so naturally they would want to recruit Raymond into their order. So we joined the Order of Whispers and met Tybalt, who we'll be doing story quests with. Normally, people think Elementalists are the class you're most likely to die on, and while that is true, once you learn how to build and play an elementalist to its true potential, it's actually perfect for this challenge because it has so much sustain and versatility with the four attunements, letting you choose healing and water attunement when you need it, damage and fire attunement, CC and air and earth, and you don't need to stick to one build either. You can swap to a staff when you need to keep many small mobs off you, dagger dagger when you want to do as much damage as possible, and a scepter focus when you want high single target damage, but also projectile reflects. Also, elementalists have access to a greater and lesser elemental summon utility, which can often serve the same purpose as a ranger's pet, so elementalist is by no means easy to kill if you're prepared for the situation. I started out building fire traits because it provides the most effect for having only one trait line, it gives good damage boost and it can give condition cleanse with these smothering auras and blinds, which will reduce a lot of damage taken. Then I go for the earth trait line at level 45, which also gives defense and damage because my auras will give me protection now as well. And with the signet trait, I can cast my signet of restoration for active healing and I can use signet of fire more often, which is one of the highest damage utilities. From there, I can go Arcane for a bit more utility and flexibility, 
or water to be even safer. Regardless, I always put misform on my bar as my get out of jail free card. There are many times where this saved me, so it is necessary even if I'll only use it once every few hours. If you get greedy for damage and you take it off your bar for a bit, you may unexpectedly need it, and then you get the ultimate punishment. Raymond progressed through the Order of Whispers until reaching the Battle of Claw Island, which is where you start seeing one of the most dangerous creatures, the Undead Abominations. These guys gain stacks of frenzy every time they hit, which can go to 25, and it gives them attack speed and damage. The NPCs here just stand in their attacks and feed them frenzy stacks, and the abominations can charge at you which will do multiple hits if you aren't paying attention. Staying out of range of these is the number one priority. I don't play around with them. I go staff and stay max range. Although we succeed in reclaiming Claw Island, we lose a dear friend Tybalt and just like for us, there is no reviving. His death is permanent. But we have to keep moving onwards. We chase Kudu, the evil inquest scientist who is misusing dragon magics into Sorrow's Embrace. In this dungeon there is a defense event where you need to protect Zoja from waves of dredge. If you don't have enough sustain and damage, you can get overwhelmed and die. But if you play too carefully, Zoja dies and she can't blow open the door. Luckily your progress is not lost when Zoja dies and I could put on the Glyph of Renewal to revive Zoja from range and then try to keep her alive with my staff as long as I can, and then repeat until the door is open. Then we face Kudu and his golems. This fight has extremely dangerous projectiles which burst you with conditions. Cleansing, reflex, and stun breaks are all necessary. I almost died getting hit, but of course I had misform ready. Then we crossed the lava area where Bree died, and made it to the last boss, which has some cool mechanics. Once you understand them, it's a pretty easy fight, just stay behind the walls when the boss is shooting across the platforms, and move out from behind the walls when the boss yanks the chain to drop lava down. The fire elementals can complicate this by immobilizing you, but it's not too hard to deal with them. Now is when the story really starts to gear towards Zaitan. I get tricked by one of Zaitan's minions into bombing my own pack members because of an illusion they set up, and lots of minor characters you see will die throughout the Siege of Ore. It puts across the dire situation that Tyria is in, but we need to stop it so we keep going on and at this point Raymond is no longer motivated by the Flame Legion's agenda. He realizes that there is a greater threat to all of Tyria if he doesn't handle this, so he becomes more involved with the Pact and with Traherne. By the way, I love Traherne. Many people hate his voice acting, but I think that it's pretty well done. He's supposed to be a shut-in scholar without a lot of charisma, and his entire character arc is about him being able to step up to a leadership position in the Pact from being a library dweller. Now is when the challenge really dials it up. From 70 to 80, there are three dungeons we have to do. Citadel of Flames, Honor of the Waves, and Crucible of Eternity. Starting with Citadel of Flames, Ritlock and Logan rekindle their friendship, and at this point we have all three trait lines, so combat is much more fluid and bosses are easier to handle, but we still have to deal with some dangerous situations. There are cliffs that you can get knocked off and die to fall damage. So I stay really close to the wall and if possible, stay away from any mobs with knockbacks. One of the bosses has a permanent burning aura which is a huge sustain check, but we can handle that easily as an elementalist. And then when we get to the final boss, Gaharan Balefire, there are some intricate mechanics you need to handle. The only way to damage him is to pick up the molten boulders that break on Logan's shield bubble. It's safe inside the bubble, but if you get run over by the boulders, you will die, and there are meteors that can knock you off or into other boulders. So I take a build with full stun breaks and ports to handle the boulders as quickly and safely as possible. Eventually you can start hitting him and then he'll go to the next phase and change up the pattern of the boulders and start raising stalagmites which can trap you between the boulders and Logan's shield bubble. So you need to be quicker. I took out Gaharan with no casualties and then headed over to the honor of the waves. Now this one is the true gatekeeper because the final boss, the Coden's Bane, has extremely hard hitting attacks that sometimes cannot be dodged. He also has a pet, 
So that's why I've been saving up all of my stat boosters from level up rewards and gemstones so that I can get as much sustain as possible to survive this final fight. All throughout the dungeon I'll be stacking my life sigil on my staff, swap my dagger focus and keep those stacks. But we're not there yet. The first encounter is an ice spike that constantly spawns ice elementals which will chill and bleed you. Chill is extremely dangerous to elementalists, so I need to kite the ice elementals away from the spike, then while they're catching up, I get some time to attack the spike, rinse and repeat while trying not to get knocked by all the ice shards flying around. Getting towards the end, there's a boss which does a sequence of ice spikes. If any of these hit you, it can stun you and get you hit by another one, and then another one. So having plenty of stun breaks and constant movement is necessary, and of course he occasionally spawns more Sons of Sonir, which complicates things further. Then we face the Honor's Voice, who has been corrupted by Jormag's blood. There isn't much to this boss besides one attack which is an ice block that stuns you 5 seconds and cannot be stun broken. If you get hit by this, you take a ton of damage and then you're pressured and have to resustain until suddenly you get ice blocked again very shortly. When you're with a party, they can easily break you out of the ice block, but alone, it gets really sketchy. Luckily, as an elementalist, you can still swap attunements while ice blocked, and because I have earth and fire traits, swapping attunements will do a small bit of damage, which is enough to break you out of the block. So as long as I can swap to either of those, I'll be fine. Now is the final boss, Coden's Bane. There are deadly sharks in the freezing cold water below the platform, so you want to avoid falling in. And then there's the Drake pet, which can stun lock you. And then there's Coden's Bane, which hits like a truck on all his attacks and can call birds to attack you with his Warhorn, which does tons of damage over a five second window, making it hard to avoid it all. For this attack, I have plenty of invulnerabilities from the Earth Shield, Mist Form, and Obsidian Flesh. You can also line of sight and the birds won't deal damage. Then I plan to slowly kill the pet and then the boss. If you can kill the pet while the boss is also there, you can kill the boss. However, surviving that amount of pressure requires an insanely safe and tanky build, which means it's going to take a really long time to kill him. So after a really long time of extremely butt-clenching gameplay, I took out the Coden's Bane by just summoning my elementals and surviving while getting in chip damage when possible after using my CC to stun the boss. After this, I was level 79 and wanted to get to 80 before going to the last dungeon, the Crucible of Eternity. But while I was doing a heart quest, I almost got killed by a storm that I had never seen before. And that's why you always put Mistform on your bar. After reaching level 80, I didn't feel any more powerful. I had already learned all of my skills and practiced them to the point where I didn't need a level to tell me how good I was. I just took out Coden's Bane by myself. So I went into Crucible of Eternity and one common thing here is that there are tons of mobs with stuns that can easily get you killed out of your control. Like these subjugators who channel a pulsing stun on you. I take the Armor of Earth and Mistform just in case, but I stay behind line of sight and try to not get hit at all so I can use my utilities in an emergency. There are also lots of mobs with projectiles and that makes the focus a great weapon to reflect with in this dungeon. Eventually, you get to another defense event where you have to keep Zoja alive, but this time, you don't keep your progress if Zoja dies and you have to start all over. This can easily be a game over moment if you overcommit to defending Zoja, or if your build lacks enough survivability to kite the mobs away from Zoja. However, with the dagger focus set, I completed the encounter without Zoja dying and restarting once. The reflex dealt with the nasty projectiles, the high amount of CC helped to manage the mobs and group them up, and then I could easily nuke the weaker mobs down in the meantime. Then we make our way to the final boss, Kudu. He starts out in his golem, which isn't hard to fight, but there are plenty of stuns and if you get stunned in his pummel attack, you will absolutely die, so having stun breaks is necessary here. When Kudu's golem is destroyed, he comes out and only has two abilities, but they are both potentially run ending. The first is a kill shot where he aims and fires an unblockable shot that can instantly down you. My reflex won't work here so I need invulnerabilities and clever use of terrain to line of sight. However, when using line of sight you get very close to Kudu and he can use his dispersion ability 
which sends out a bunch of sparks. And if you're on top of him when he does this, it's possible to get hit by all of them. So you need to always dodge through him. Then he will appear randomly at one of the sparks locations, which means he can put himself in a position to easily shoot you if you don't react fast and find which one he's at and then reposition behind a wall for the kill shot. I try to keep behind the walls because this is the last boss of the dungeon. If I can get by this, we should be fine. After Kudu is taken out, his dragon energy infused undead giant is pretty easy as well so long as you stay at range and don't stand in any of the fires. If you become crystallized, you're stuck there for 30 seconds, but you can use instant cast mobility skills to get out of it. Afterwards, we've resolved all of the personal problems each individual Destiny's Edge member has, and we can finally reunite them all. Now we can head through Or and confront Zaitan. Now I'm level 80 and have pretty decent leveling gear with some exotics, but some of the story missions are truly unhinged. Going to the altar of Duena in a siege golem suit almost got me killed because I had to learn how the thing worked while being assaulted by waves of undead, and fighting the eye and mouth of Zaitan aren't particularly pushover fights, but we've got the power of the pact at our disposal. However, there is one instance that is extremely scary. We go to the altar of Lissa and Traherne shows us the Orion funerary ritual, and of course, after every fight, Traherne makes sure to keep the motivation high with praise. Well done. Hey Traherne, how do you like your steaks? Well done. Uh-huh. That's what I thought. After finishing the slow tour around the place, there's a group of veteran risen and one of these is a special undead abomination. It's got all the same attacks as a normal abomination, but it's immune to all CC and it's smaller than the rest, so it can easily one-shot you if you're not paying attention. It's extremely unnerving trying to kite this thing when it one-shots all my elementals, but I eventually found its one weakness. Pathing. All I had to do was jump up this small ledge that only an Asura wouldn't be able to get over. Then when the abomination comes toward me, I go to the other side and it takes the long way around. Repeat until dead. Finally, it's time to enter the ruined city of Ara. This used to be a five-man story dungeon, but for obvious reasons, they changed the final story mission to be balanced around soloing it, so this should be easier than the last few dungeons we've been through. And it was. Besides resisting the call to the void and pressing my staff 4 in fire attunement and falling off the airship, there isn't too much pressure in these situations. Obviously, there is a real threat that you will die if you ignore the enemies and just stay on the cannons, but if you just take your time and get off the cannon to clear out the enemies, it should be easy. Then there's a fight with the mouth of Zaitan, and this guy shoots out boulders which did a decent amount of damage. I didn't really stick around to see if I can get hit by multiple of them, because I can't really afford to be experimenting right now. I just threw the boulders in to make him vulnerable and then did my damage. But that's one of the things that's interesting about this playstyle or game mode. If I don't know something is dangerous, but it looks dangerous, I assume it's dangerous even if it may not be, which creates more intensity than playing a non-permadeath playthrough where I can afford to make mistakes to see how punishing they are. So even when my actions have no consequence, I think they do. But really, they do. This entire journey required many decisions and my survival depended on my knowledge and preparedness. But wait, we still need to finish off Zaitan, so I get on the cannon and spam one. Yeah, this fight is not the most engaging for sure. You could be killed maybe if you stood still, but at this point it's going to be a win. But the entire point of the plot is gathering allies, building the pact, and learning the weaknesses of Zaitan. You aren't going to 1v1 an Elder Dragon in its true form, so it definitely makes sense. But it lacks the epic cinematic feeling of a final boss for sure. Still, a win is a win. We've mended old rivalries helped Kate and Traherne finish their wild hunts, and we've also completed my wild hunt to defeat Zaitan and all story dungeons without dying. This was a really fun experience, and I'd like to see if I can continue with Season 1, 2, and then Heart of Thorns, but maybe I'll consider this a checkpoint. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this journey. If you want to experience it for yourself, don't be afraid to change up your rules. And don't forget to subscribe if you like this content. 
A big thanks to my patrons, they help to fund my content and keep it coming, but thank you all for watching. So if you want to support me, please do so in the links below, and I will see you all next time.